Hi, everybody. How you doing? Good. Um, let's take a look at resistors a little bit more. We started talking about resistors in series and resistors in parallel yesterday. Let's try one more example of that and see if we can make it pretty complicated and how we might simplify it. Again, if you are watching this live uh, at home, feel free to chime in. We've got Hilda here manning the moderator station. And so if you have a question, just fire it off to her and she'll relay it to me. Okay, let's try this example right here. Okay, so we have a voltage V, and now we have a very complicated set of resistors. And let's label these R1, R2, R3, R4, and R5. And remember, the goal here is to get that entire circuit into something that looks like this. One voltage and one resistance R equivalent. And we need to find that R equivalent. What is the equivalent resistance of this circuit? And then once we do that, of course, we can determine the current in the circuit. Okay, how do we do that? What we said last time was start from the innermost point, okay, the most complicated innermost set of resistors. And it looks like that's going to be these two in parallel right here. So let's redraw the circuit as the following. R1, and then it splits. We have R2, and then those two in parallel, we are going to replace with RP. And we'll call it RP34, which means 3 and 4 are added in parallel. The other side of that wire went down to R5, and then the wires came back together, and off they went back to the battery. All right, that's the first step. How do I identify that RP34? Well, we know that they add in parallel. So 1 over RP is going to be 1 over R3 plus 1 over R4. So yesterday we said at this point you could just plug in some numbers and then take the inverse of that to calculate RP34. That's perfectly acceptable. All right, so now we have a simpler circuit. And now we have to again go into the innards. And it looks like this 2 in series right here is going to be important. So let's redraw the circuit. Battery, R1. And then it splits. And we're going to have some RS in series on that side. We still have R5 over on the other side. Wires come back together and goes back to the battery. All right, so you're going to get a value for RP34 from this one. How do you get the value of RS over here? Well, those are just two added in series. That's not too bad. So it's R2 plus whatever we found in the first step, RP34. All right, now we're dealing with this circuit. And let's wrap around the board here, and we'll draw it over on this side. Okay, just like in the old game Asteroids, right? You go around one side of the screen, you immediately come back in on the other. Anybody remember that game? That was like the popular arcade game when I was a kid. We used to go down to 7-Eleven put in our quarters into the Asteroids game. And there was always one guy that had like way more points than anybody else. He would sit there for like three hours playing the game. And everybody else stood there drinking their Slurpees going, wow, he's so cool. OK, what were we talking about? All right, yeah, circuits, right? So let's take that circuit and bring it back over here. And let's simplify it again. So R1 is going to stay where it is. But now we have two that are, again, in parallel. So we need to draw a parallel resistor. 
and it's going to be parallel combining S and 5. Okay, and what is this RPS5? Well, again, we're adding them in parallel. So RPS5 is going to be 1 over RS plus 1 over R5. Okay, we found RS from this step, and so you can plug it in there. R5 would be given to you, you plug it in there, you take one over those, add them up, and then you take the inverse to calculate RPS5. And now we're at the last step. The last step is our basic circuit, one resistor, and now we can call that R equivalent. Okay? That's what they mean. When they say find the equivalent resistance, simplify it down to one circuit element, and that's your R equivalent. And now R equivalent is those two things added in series. So it's R1 plus RPS5. So there is a lot buried in that RPS5, of course. It has all the other resistors buried into it in some complicated fashion. But if you go through step by step and just calculate numbers, at this point you would just have a number for RPS5 and you can plug it right into there. And now if you're trying to find something like the equivalent current, well, we just go back to Ohm's law. I is V divided by this equivalent resistance. This would be the resistance of the circuit. This would be the current in that circuit. Okay. And like we said before, you can do this for extremely complicated arrangements of resistors. You can always reduce it to a simple circuit. Let's talk about how you might measure the stuff. Okay, you have done this in your lab. You've measured voltages. You've probably even measured current. And what you use is various meters. It's usually one meter that has a bunch of different settings on it. But let's say we go back to our basic circuit for a second. Battery and resistor. And I want to measure how much current flows. Okay? The way I measure current is I insert something called an ammeter. called an ammeter because it measures amps. Okay. The ammeter has to go in line with that wire. So I'm going to take a device and I'm going to stick it right there and I'm going to label it I for current. That thing is my ammeter. Okay. It has to be in line with the wire, meaning if you had a solid wire you would have to break it, connect one end to the ammeter, connect the other end to the other side of the ammeter. It's got to measure how much current is actually going through it. Okay? If you have a circuit like this, and now you take your ammeter and you simply connect it with wires like that, this will measure zero current. Okay, it's got to be in the circuit wire itself. You can't just attach it in parallel somewhere else. It has to be in series. Okay, an ideal ammeter, in fact, has zero resistance because you don't want the ammeter to affect the circuit. If it did have resistance, then of course it would change how much current is going to flow through that circuit without the ammeter. Usually you want an idea of how much current is going to flow in that circuit normally. And if you put in another resistor right there, that's going to change how much current flows. 
if the ammeter has zero resistance, then it won't change how much current flows. Now, ideal ammeters, of course, don't really exist. So there's always some small amount of resistance that you're going to add to your circuit when you put the ammeter in. And so just by measuring it, you're going to change that current. And this is sort of a, an important consideration. Whenever you're doing physics, always remember, the act of measuring it is going to change the experiment a little bit. Okay? And there's basically no way around that. How do we measure voltage, right? If we were measuring current, we'd stick it in series. But now we want to measure voltage, which is something different, of course, than current. And now let's say we want to measure voltage. Okay. How do we measure voltage? Well, we use a voltmeter. Took them a long time to come up with that name. What should we call this meter that measures volts? How about a voltmeter? Where do you put the voltmeter? You put it across the resistor. Okay? You are interested in measuring voltage across this resistor. And so you have to take wires and connect it to either side of that resistor. If current I is flowing, then we know that there is a voltage drop across the resistor, and you can measure that with your voltmeter. Now, we want all that current to go through R. We want hardly any current to go through this arm over here, through the voltmeter. So an ideal voltmeter has a resistance equal to infinity. Okay, so it's the exact opposite of the ammeter. Ammeter has zero resistance. Voltmeter has infinite resistance. Because you don't want any current going through here. If you have an infinite amount of resistance there, no current can flow in that arm of the circuit. It won't change the measurement. Now, you guys have played with these things. And you, in fact, probably have a device that has an ammeter and a voltmeter and can also, re um, what do they call it? They call it an ohm meter because it measures resistance. Anybody know what that device is called, the ones that you guys have been using in lab? It's called a multimeter because it's a meter that measures multiple things, right? It can measure current, it can measure volts, it can measure resistance. You just have to change the knobs on it, change the settings, and then change the connections on the front panel. Okay, so this is what you guys have been playing with in lab, multimeters. And typically whenever you go to a Home Depot or someplace like that, you say, I need a voltmeter. They're gonna sell you a multimeter. It's got everything built into it all in one. Okay, we've talked a lot about resistors in circuits. The next element that we need to include is capacitors. Okay, so what do capacitors do in circuits? Well, let's think about the battery again for a second. The battery has a positive side and a negative side. And the positive side is the long bar the negative side is the short bar. Okay, so if you take a AA battery, the one that says plus, that's the long bar. Let's hook up a capacitor here in this circuit. Remember, a capacitor we draw with two equal length lines, which is supposed to distinguish it from a battery. And that capacitor has a capacitance C. If I put this capacitor in this circuit, it's going to charge up. Namely, there is going to be some positive charge on one side and some negative charge on the other side. Which side should have the positive charge? The top side or the bottom side? The top side. The top side should be positively charged. 
the bottom should be negatively charged. How do you know that? Well, the battery has a whole bunch of positive charge on that side of the battery. And it's going to push away other positive charge through this wire. And that positive charge is going to accumulate on the top of the capacitor. Likewise, the negative side of the battery, which has a whole bunch of negative charge on it, is going to push negative charge away and end up on the bottom side of the capacitor. Okay, So that original statement that we said, like charges repel, you can really discover a lot about circuits just remembering that. Like charges repel each other. So positive charge on this side of the battery is going to push positive charge away from it onto the top of that capacitor. How much charge? How much charge is on the capacitor? Well, I don't know. You guys know? We have a relationship between charge and voltage, right? What's the relationship? Q equals CV. I know C, I would give that to you. It's a number like 5 microfarads or 10 picofarads, okay? It's some set number that only depends on the geometry of the device, what it's made out of and the geometry of it. And now if I attach a voltage to it, the voltage V is the same voltage across that capacitor because everything else is connected by metal wires. So what's the charge on the capacitor? CV. Okay. This is the charge on one plate. Obviously, the capacitor has equal and opposite charge on the other plate, so the net charge on the whole thing would be zero. But when we say what's the charge on the capacitor, we mean what's the charge on one side of it? What's that positive charge? It's Q. Okay, but let's try something a little more complicated now. Let's say we hook up two capacitors like this. We'll call this one C1 and we will call this one C2. Okay, so I've just added a second capacitor onto the first one and it looks like we've done it in parallel as opposed to series. What is the charge on capacitor 1? Well, the voltage across it is still just V, because those are wires connected right to the battery. So the charge is going to be C1 times V. The charge on C2 is going to be C2 times V, because it also sees the same potential, right? It's also connected by metal wires to the battery, and so the charge on it is just C2 times V. So, Let's ask the question, what is the total charge that is stored on the positive plates of those capacitors? Well, we just add it up, right? Total Q is going to be Q1 plus Q2. Piece of cake. What is Q1? We said it's C1V. What is Q2? It is C2 times V. And now I have a common V in both of those, so I can factor it out. And the total charge is just C1 plus C2 times V. And that thing we can call C sub P V. This refers to parallel. We've added these things in the parallel configuration, and yet somehow the capacitance has added up, which is very different than resistors. Okay? When you add capacitors in parallel, you simply add their capacitances to calculate the equivalent capacitance of that circuit. Parallel capacitors add battery V, and that whole thing simplified to our simple circuit. 
one battery, one capacitor, but this capacitor is in parallel. And the rule for adding capacitors in parallel is you add up the capacitances. All right. By adding those two, we have in fact increased the capacitance. Okay. And one way to think about this is it's just like you took these metal plates and you doubled their area. If these were equal capacitances and I had two metal plates that were separated by that and I brought them together, I would just double the area of the capacitor. And when you double the area of a capacitor, you double its capacitance. Okay, how much energy are we dealing with in this case? Well, remember energy is CV squared. One half CV squared is the energy storage in a capacitor. And so we have one half CV squared in that one. We have one half CV squared in the other one. And we know that we can add those up because we have some common factors. C1 plus C2, all times V squared. But C1 plus C2 is the exact same as CP. So this is one half CP V squared. Okay, when you have a circuit like this and it charges up, the capacitor has energy in it of one half CP V squared. The other type of capacitor circuit uh, that we need to deal with is, of course, when we add them in series. So let's go back to our circuit. And now we're going to take capacitor C1 and we're going to add capacitor C2 in series, okay, one after the other along the wire. Let's think about where all the charge is. On the top plate of C1, there is going to be positive Q. If there is positive Q on that top plate, then there must be minus Q on the bottom plate. Okay, the whole capacitor has to stay neutral. If there is minus Q on the bottom plate, then there has to be positive Q on the second plate of capacitor, on the top plate of capacitor 2, and therefore there is minus Q on the bottom plate of C2. There is a voltage drop across capacitor 1, which is V1. There is a voltage drop ac across capacitor 2, which is V2. Okay? But they all have the same amount of charge on them. So Kirchhoff's laws told us the following. If we start at some point in a circuit and we go around the circuit, the sum of the voltage increases has to be equal to the sum of the voltage drops. And so Kirchhoff's law says the following, V going up minus V1 going down minus V2 going down has to be equal to zero. This is Kirchhoff's circuit law, okay, or his loop rule. If I move the V1 and the V2 over to the other side, then this just becomes V equals V1 plus V2. All right. But these things have the same charge on each capacitor, and there is a relationship between charge and voltage. The same charge on C1 and C2 and we know what that is, right? Q equals CV. So if Q equals CV, then we must have V equals Q over C. And therefore, I can write V1 equals Q over C1. V2 equals Q over C2. And now I can take those two things and stick them right into this equation. And so what does this equation become? It becomes Q over C1 plus Q over C2. But we also know what V is in the case of the equivalent circuit. 
In the equivalent circuit, we have one capacitor. It was in series, and so it's going to have a value C sub S. And so I could say V is equal to Q over C sub S. And so this whole line right here equals Q over C sub S. And now you see exactly what happens, right? If I look at this equation right here, I have Q over C sub 1 plus Q over C sub 2 equals Q over C sub S. I can divide the right and left of that equation by Q, and I get 1 over C sub S equals 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. And this is the rule for series capacitors. When you add capacitors in series, you add their inverses, whereas in parallel, we added their direct capacitances. Okay, so in this case, capacitance is in fact going to decrease. When I add two capacitors in series, the resultant capacitance is going to be less than both of them. The whole capacitance decreases. When I added them in parallel, the capacitance increased. All right, so let's see if we can summarize the rule for resistors and capacitors. So the resistors in series, we know how they behave. R sub S equals R1 plus R2. Piece of cake. But in parallel, we have to add their inverses. 1 over RP equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Here we added resistances. Here we, in fact, added currents, and that led to the inverse of the resistor. For capacitors, we have exactly the opposite. So for series, we add the inverses. And for parallel, we add the direct values. Okay? And so you can see the symmetry here, right? Those two behave the same, and those two behave the same. Resistors and capacitors behave exactly opposite in series versus parallel. So let's say we do the following. Let's, to start with, let's just say we do this. We take a battery, we have a switch, and we have a capacitor. Okay? This device right here is just a switch. The break in the wire, I'm going to close the switch. Okay. When I have the switch open like this, what is the current I in the circuit? Switch is open, so there's no connection in this wire right here. What's the current I in the circuit at that point? What is it 90% of the time when I ask you a question? Zero. zero, right? I is zero. There's no current flowing. Okay? Why is there no current flowing? Because the wire is broken. Those electrons that are trying to move through get to the end of the wire and they say, I can't go any further. I'm going to stop. All right, but now we close the switch. Okay, so the switch is now closed. Here's our capacitor. Is there I in the circuit? And to be fair, let's say we're looking right after we close the switch. Okay, we didn't have any current. And now we're going to close that switch, which connects the wire. 
is there going to be current in that circuit? What do you guys think? Yes, there is going to be current. Because it's got to charge up the capacitor. It is trying to get some charge on that side of the capacitor, some charge on that side of the capacitor. So there has to be movement of charge. If there's movement of charge, there's current. All right. Now we wait a long time. The switch has been closed for a while. A long time later. Is there any current flowing in that circuit? What is the current flowing in that circuit if we wait for a long time? Somebody wants to say it, they're on the zero. Okay? It's zero again. Why is it zero? I mean, I've made this connection here, right? I have a voltage in this battery that wants to push current around, and yet we're saying if we wait a long time, it goes to zero. Why is that? Because there is a gap right there. The capacitor is two parallel plates. And so if you wait until those plates get charged up, you can't put any more charge onto those plates. And that can't jump across from one plate to another because there's a gap there. There's no connection. Literally, it's a parallel plate, a space in air or some other material, and then there's another plate, another piece of metal. And so it can't jump across that gap. So it goes for a while charging up the capacitor. But then later on, it is fully charged. And so the current goes to zero. It's kind of like when you charge up your batteries, right? A rechargeable battery is very much like a capacitor. Right? You put it in your charger. You close the switch, current starts flowing. After a while, your battery is fully charged. There's no more current flowing. You take it out and you use it. And then you drain all the energy out. You do that again at the end of the day. OK, let's do it now with a real resistor in the circuit and see how it behaves. So let's draw the battery. We've got our switch. And then we're going to put a capacitor right there. And we'll put a resistor right next to it. Both of these are coming down and back to the negative side of the battery. Now, when the switch is open, there's no current flowing, of course, because there's a break in the wire right there. So as soon as we close the switch, something's going to happen. Switch is closed. Current starts to flow. And we can think about the charge on the capacitor. Okay? What is the charge on the capacitor? Well, we know that. Some Q naught is equal to C times V naught. Okay. If we open the switch after the capacitor is charged up, let's see if we can figure out what's going to happen. Okay, and I guess we call this initial voltage V naught on the battery. And you'll see why we did that in a second. So when we open the switch, the current in this part of the circuit, of course, stops flowing. But there is a whole bunch of positive charge on that side of the capacitor and a whole bunch of negative charge on the other side of the capacitor. And so now the capacitor, in fact, looks like a battery 
and can drive current I through this part of the circuit. It's attached to a resistor and so it can drive current around like that. And now let's think about what happens to this charge on the capacitor. As you start to power this current around this loop, the charge on the capacitor decreases. And you can write down a nice little differential equation to understand exactly how the charge decreases on the capacitor. But like a lot of things in physics, you might guess, it's got to be exponential. And so that is, in fact, what happens. Charge on the capacitor is where it started, which we called Q naught. And then we have an E to the minus T over RC. Or Q naught E to the minus T over tau. Tau is called the time constant. Not to be confused with torque, right? We use tau for torque, uh, unfortunately. But now, tau is just the time constant of that circuit, okay? And it's equal to RC. So if you think about what the charge on the capacitor looks like as a function of time, we can draw it out. It started at t equals zero and a value of q naught. That's how much charge was on our capacitor. But then it started to discharge and it decayed exponentially. And so it fell like this. Okay, and what's the shape of that curve? It's exactly that. Q naught e to the minus t over tau where tau equals RC. Tau is the 1 over E point. Okay. It's how long does it take for that charge to drop to 1 over E its value. Right, E is a natural number, 2.7, blah, 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 blah. 1 over E is going to be somewhere about there. Okay, this is the 1 over E point, Q naught over E. And you can see, if I put T equals tau here, I get E to the minus 1. And so that becomes a Q naught over E. That's the 1 over E point. And this is how you characterize RC circuits. If you have a very big resistor R, then your time constant is much bigger. And this thing decays less steeply. It takes longer to get rid of the charge. That makes sense, right? You're trying to push it through this resistor, that river full of rocks, and it's hard to push it through there. But if R is very small, then this thing will decay very quickly. You will discharge the capacitor very quickly. Likewise, if you have a very big capacitor, C, then you have a lot of charge that you're trying to move. And so again, this thing will decay very slowly. But if it's a small capacitor, C, then it's not much charge that you have to get rid of, and it will decay much more quickly than that. Okay, so the shape of that curve is dictated by the time constant, which depends on the values of R and the values of C. Hi everybody, welcome back. Uh, let's take a look at uh, one of your homework problems that uh, is in chapter 19. And this is a, a resistor problem, uh, but it's a little bit extra complicated because we have extra batteries in it. So this is uh, number 1930 on your homework. And let's see if we can attack this together. So, um, we have a circuit that looks like the following. We have a battery sitting right here. I'll give you not my numbers. It is 58 volts. There is a resistor right there, which is 120 ohms. 
There is a resistor here, which is 82 ohms. And then it comes back up through a resistor right here. And that resistor is 64 ohms. And then there's another part of the circuit. Okay, over here there is a resistor of 25 ohms. There is a battery right here of 3 volts. There is a resistor here of 110 ohms. And then the wire connects back around like that. Okay, that's what the circuit looks like. And there are parts A through infinity, it looks like. And uh, each part is basically saying, what's the current through this resistor, and this resistor, and this resistor? Okay, we need to find the currents through each of the resistors. So, how do we, how do we attack this? Well, let's go back to Kirchhoff's rules for circuits. Okay, Kirchhoff's rules. What were they? One was the current at a junction has to be continuous. So whatever current is going in has to equal whatever current is going out. Okay, and then we also had the loop rule, which said that the voltages that are rising minus the voltages that are dropping has to equal zero around a closed loop. Okay, so let's consider two things. Let's consider the following. We've got current in this circuit right here, but we also have current in this circuit right here. And let's think about the first rule, the junction rule. Current in equals current out. If I have I2 coming into that junction, and I have I1 coming out this way, then I have I3 coming down. Okay, but we know the junction rule says that the current in has to equal the current out. So, I2 going in has to equal I1 plus I3 going out. All right, I1 is going to come all the way back around to here. I3 is coming down and then it picks up again to I2, and so we have the same rule over here, I1 plus I3 going in equals I2 going out. All right, so that tells us what the currents are doing at those junctions. Now, how do we analyze the loop rule? The loop rule says the following. Start at some point, go around the closed loop, and whatever voltages are rising, minus the ones that are dropping, that has to equal zero. So if I start at this point right here and I follow that path, what is the first one that I come to? Well, the first thing I come to is the battery. So I get plus 58 volts. The next thing I come to is a resistor, okay? And that resistor is a voltage drop, and we said that we have current I1 flowing through those wires. And so we have to subtract I1 times 120 ohms. We continue around this loop, and we hit this resistor down here, the 82 ohm resistor, that is another voltage drop. And so we have I1 times 82 ohms. 
And now we get to the 64 ohm resistor, right? We have to continue around this loop. And now we have to decide, is the voltage drop across this thing, should I put a positive here or a negative? Well, there is current I3 in that resistor going down. And if I was going down, then it would be a negative, right? I would have a voltage drop. But since in our path we're coming back up through it, it becomes positive. We're going to increase in voltage. And so we get plus, what is the drop there? It is I3 in that arm times the resistance 60, 64 ohms. Okay, and that is a complete loop there. And all of that equals zero. Okay, one equation. Now we need to do something similar for the loop on the right. And let's start at the same point and we will go around in that direction. And we'll see what we get in this arm. Okay, so the path on the right is going to be what? We're going to start at this point. We're going to go down through this resistor. There is current I3 going through it. And so we need minus I3 times 64 ohms. We come along here and we are now with current I2. And there is no resistors here that we don't have to worry about anything there. But now we're going to go through the 110 ohm resistor. And we have minus I2 times 110 ohms. We then get to the battery. And if you look, the short line is on the bottom. The long line is on the top, which means we are increasing in voltage. So we have to add 3 volts from that battery. And then finally, we go through the 25 ohm resistor, and it is in the direction of the current. And so we drop, again, I2 times 25 ohms. And all of that equals 0. So we have one, two equations, but we, in fact, have three unknowns. The other equation that you need is from the junction rule, which tells you that the currents are going to add up. And now you can solve for whatever you like. Okay? Let's see if we can do that. Let's see if we can solve for I1 and I2. We had I2 equals I1 plus I3. Okay? And just Real quickly, let's remind ourselves what the circuit looked like. It looked like this. We had I1 in that arm, I2 in that arm, I3 coming down the middle. Okay, so let's solve this thing for I1 and I2. And we can ignore all the units on all these things. So this first equation, what do we have? We have 58, then we have minus 120 I1 minus 82 I1 plus I3 times 64. But I3, we know, is I2 minus I1. And all of that equals 0. Okay, And so we can put a bunch of terms together here. Let's do that. We've got 58. And then we've got minus I1 times 120 plus 82 plus 64. And then we have plus 64I2. All that equals 0. And we can add these things up, right? 120 plus 82 is 202. 
And then we've got another 64, so we get 266. And then we still have 64i2. Okay, so here's one equation that we can use. And now let's simplify the second equation. So this one becomes what? We've got a minus 64 times I3. But again, we know I3 is I2 minus I1. And then we've got minus 110 I2. We've got a plus 3. And then we've got minus 25 I2. All that equals zero. And now we can uh, put a bunch of common terms together. It looks like we have a bunch of I2s. So minus I2 times 64 plus 110 plus 25. And then we've got plus 64 I1. And we've got plus 3. All of that equals zero. Okay, and now we can simplify this. What do we get? 110 plus 64 is 174. And then we're going to add 25 to it. So that's 199. So this becomes I2 times 199 plus 64I1 plus 3 equals zero. All right, two equations, two unknowns. Let's solve for I1 and I2. Okay, so let's solve this first equation for uh, how about I1. So I can rewrite it. I have 266 I1 equals what? I just moved that over to the other side, so this becomes 58 uh, plus 64 I2. And so we get I1 equals 58 plus 64 I2, all of that over 266. And now we have this equation down here, and we just solved for I1 in the first one. So let's rewrite this equation. And what do we get? We get minus 199 I2 plus 64 I1 plus 3 equals 0, and we will plug in what we got for I1. 58 plus 64 I2 all over 266 plus 3 equals 0, and now we can solve this equation for I2. We've got minus 199 I2 plus 64 times 58 over 266 plus 64 times 64 divided by 266 I2 plus 3 equals 0. And let's combine our I2. So we have I2 times 64 squared over 266 minus 199. And then we have this term plus 64 times 58 over 266 plus 3. Now, somebody punch this stuff into your calculator and tell me what you get. What do you get? 64 squared over 266 minus 199. What do you get when you do that? Negative 183.6. Really? Yeah, I got that too. Okay. What about this one? Anybody do that one? I got 
16.95, including the three? Okay. Okay. So let's take a look at that. And if that is confirmed, then do this calculation and tell me what you get for I2. Okay, and what do you get for I2 right here? Point zero nine two, yeah. like that. Okay, and the units are amps. Zero point zero nine two amps. And if we go back to our um, the circuit that we had, it looked like this. And we had I one right here, I two right there, and I three right there. So let's try the first part A and see if we're right, because it says it wants the current in the 25 ohm resistor, which is this arm right here in I2. And so let's see if we're right. Point zero nine two amps, submit it, and guess what? We're right. Actually says correct. So believe it or not, after all those numbers, we did get the correct answer on that one. Okay, but we need I1 because we need to know these other resistors. So let's calculate I1. I1 is 58 plus 64 times I2, which we just said is 0 0.092. And then we're going to divide all that by 266. And what do you get if you do that? 0 0.24, okay, 0 0.24 amps, okay, and that's the second part B, which is the voltage, or the uh, current through the 120 ohm resistor, so let's try that, 0 0.24, that's a comma, we don't want that, we're not in Europe, 0 0.24 amps, and voila, that one's also correct, okay? And now the last part is they want to know what's the current through the middle resistor here, I3, and we have a relationship which is I2 equals I1 plus I3, right? The junction rule for that. And so I3 is I2 minus I1. So if I take that and I subtract that, what do I get? Negative what? <laughs> 0 0.15. Okay. And I don't know if they actually want plus or minus signs here. So I think they just want magnitudes, but I'll be your guinea pig. Let's try it out. 0 0.15 amps, submit it, correct. Okay, so they're not worried about the direction. They just want to know the current through it. And now you have all the other parts because the other parts are going to be, uh, part D is going to be the same as part A, and part E is going to be the same as part B. Okay? All right, good solid, challenging problem. Everybody okay with that one? It got pretty complicated pretty quickly. Right? We could have carried resistors R1 and R2s all the way through, but I wanted to make sure that you guys could relate those values to the values that you have in yours.